Uh, welcome back to the Classics of Immunology Journal Club. And before we get started, don't forget to like the video and also if you like it and, and also to subscribe and then to, to the site and also um, click on the, the bell to get notified and check out my website, scroll down on the YouTube site to get my um, URL and check on the writing tab, click on the writing tab to find all the classic papers and you'll find this one there too, that what we're gonna do today. And today, um, this is another classic paper. This is one of, also one of my favorites, <laughs> not because it's my papers, not one of my papers, mm -hmm. but it's by a single author, Julia Turner. And it's entitled, IL-2 dependent induction of G1 cyclins in primary T cells is not blocked by rapamycin or, or cyclosporin A. And it appeared in the International Immunology Journal in October of 1993. Mm -hmm. Now, the background on this uh, paper is that Julia Turner was a trainee um, with um, Tim Hunt at Cambridge in the UK. And Tim Hunt was um, so celebrated because he discovered uh, these proteins that, that subsequently be, that he named cyclins. Um, and he went on after this paper, and on, this is 93, he went on after this to win the Nobel Prize in 2001 uh, for his discovery of these proteins called cyclins. He did his work, uh, you know, he was a biochemist and cell, cell biologist, and he would summer. You know how these uh, British professors are. They, they, they have places where they summer uh, or winter, depending on the, what their bent is. He summered at, um, at, um, at Woods Hole off the coast in Massachusetts, where there's an oceanographic laboratory there that's famous. And he, um, there were people there that were studying the, the synch synchronized cell cycle um, by looking at different marine organisms and, and uh, usually the oocytes from these organisms. And there was, there was a plethora of sea urchins in the waters uh, surrounding the, um, the Institute. And so he had a ready supply of material to study and um, he applied his biochemical techniques to the to the synchronized mm -hmm. cellular division of, of these uh, sea urchin oocytes once they were fertilized. Mm -hmm. and, and as the saying goes, it, and so he showed, showed proteins that would come up and come down and go back up again with the next cycle and so forth. And, and as, they, as the saying goes, the rest is history. Um, that was an important discovery. <clears throat> and... The other thing I like about this paper is that in the in the introduction or in the in the in the acknowledgments, uh, Julia Turner acknowledges Doreen Cantrell, who was my trainee, for uh, advice and help with her experiments. In the, in the introduction of this paper, Julia uh, references two uh, of our first papers. One was the the Julia Stern Smith paper from 1986 about the use of the um, um, Cantrell Smith paper, which was the second reference in this in this paper uh, that we had out that, to, to basically say that you could study the cell cycle progression and cell cycle biochemistry and molecular biology with this T cell system much better than you could do anything else. And she took it to heart. And so this whole paper is based on <clears throat> the whole IL-2 T cell system. And she, it's, it's a I, it's a fantastic uh, demonstration of the power of the system and, um, and her hard work and ingenuity in asking the right kinds of questions. They begin, or she begins, by stating um, uh, from our uh, 84 paper and the 86 uh, CMIB paper uh, that the T cell receptor triggering causes the, the cells to become competent to undergo cell cycle progression and DNA replication and mitosis, but it won't, they won't do them until they get a progression signal and the progression signal is supplied by IL-2. Um, the other thing that, that was, um, that was um, stated in the introduction is that um, the commitment to undergo DNA replication and, and mitosis is an all or none decision or all, all or none commitment and this is essentially the restriction point of Art Pardee that we that I've talked about in the past. Um, and she, she points out that because it's it's all or none, it's quantal. 
in cell cycle or in cell biological terms, quantum means all or none. That's what it's all about. And that, that it's signaled by a threshold of signals coming from the IL-2, IL-2 receptor interaction. And furthermore, that there's only three variables that you have to deal with in, these, uh, in this situation. One is the concentration of the ligand, IL-2. Second is the concentration or the density, cell surface density of the IL-2 receptor. And the third is the duration that these two molecules have to interact with one another. And it's not an instantaneous um, uh, signaling and, and commitment and decision-making process. It takes several hours. So that allowed her to then map out exactly what was going on with regard to um, the cyclins, which was Tim Hunt's bailiwick. And the other thing that had happened in this system, so Tim Hunt worked with uh, sea urchin eggs and um, oocytes and, and first reported in 1982 about cyclins. But, and it wasn't until 91, 92, where uh, there was several papers that came out basically but simultaneously, the discovery of cyclins in mammalian cells that were, that seemed to be expressed primarily in G1. And of course, this is what Julia Turner was looking for because she had read our papers and she was saying, okay, well, we have to concentrate on G G1, right? And so that's what she did for this paper. And so uh, that uh, sort of does it and we can go on to the materials and methods. Um, and so she details the cellular experiments, the short-term culture of human peripheral blood mononuclear cells, to which they call the modified Cantrell-Smith system. They would take PBMCs, activate them with PHA for three days, and then culture the cells in IL-2 for 10 days, and then wash them out of their IL-2 after they would express IL-2 receptors and they would proliferate and expand and then, um, as Doreen had shown, they would start to lose uh, IL-2 receptors over time, the alpha chain of the IL-2 receptor, and they would then sort of reaccumulate in, in early G1. And so she would, after 10 days of IL-2 uh, uh, proliferation and expansion, she would then wash them out of IL-2 for two days and let them rest. They would all reaccumulate in early G1. And then she could activate, and this was also shown by Doreen, she could activate the expression of the re-expression of the alpha chain of the IL-2 receptor by a 4-ball ester. And she used 4-ball dibutyrate, which Doreen had found. Um, it's just a, a short um, a fatty acid chain on it, a butyrate that you can, um, that was uh, more soluble so that you could wash out the 4-ball ester after you're done with this incubation. So you would hit them with four ball dibutyrate overnight, 12 hours, and then you're ready to do the experiments. So then for cell cycle analysis, she could use um, the propidium iodide quantitative DNA staining. And so in order to do that, you'd take the cells at different time points uh, in your experiment, fix them with 95% uh, ethanol and 5% acetic acid, then you could uh, add propidium iodide uh, and stain them. And it would, the DNA would quantitatively take up the, the propidium iodide stain. And then you could quantify everything by the flow cytometer. And then you could also use the flow cytometer to assay for cell viability, for cell size, for IL-2 receptor expression. And she also looked at the transferrin receptor because that was one of the receptors that, um, that is necessary for DNA replication because you need iron um, for that uh, in, as, as a cofactor. And, and so NIL2 induces the expression of the transferrin receptor. Um, so then uh, at the same time, that, or at the, at the same time that you could do that, you could then uh, take the cells, lyse the cells and, um, and extract RNA so that you could uh, uh, use six molar guan guanidine hydrochloride and then uh, precipitate the RNA with ethanol and um, extract it with a, phen a phenol chloroform mixture, but which by then was essentially routine. And uh, you could then electrophoresis RNA uh, and then transfer the, electro the electrophoretic pattern onto nitrocellulose uh, paper. And, and then you could use um, cDNA probes, radio-labeled cDNA probes to blot 
um, to identify the RNA species that you're interested in. And so then, and after you, so you could then use, do the whole experiment on the, of the thing and, and block for one um, RNA. And then you could, and, and then what, after, after you would do that, you would expose the, um, the paper to a, um, to x-ray and put it in the freezer and let it go for hours or days or even you know, a week or two uh, and look look then at, on the x-ray film for for uh, where the radio label was and you have molecular weight standards and so forth. Um, so that's what she did. She also wanted to analyze the cycle and basically she was focused on the cyclin D um, uh, molecules, RNA molecules. She also wanted to look at the protein level in order to do that, she had to make a, a um, an anti serum, which she made a cyclin D three, and and by using purified protein, immunizing rabbits, and, and then affinity purifying the antibody from the serum, and using that to do um, uh, protein blots. Um, in the results that we will see on the screen sharing, this is Figure one, and this is a great figure because it shows what happens after uh, activate cells that have been treated with four ball di dibutyrate so that they express the uh, IL-2 receptor. If you then add IL-2, so this is time zero. These are four ball dibutyrate activated or treated cells so that they express the receptor. You give them IL-2 for, um, for 21.5 hours in this experiment. And you can see what happens. This is forward scatter versus cell number. And they, the cells get very, very big. And without anything, or at time zero, they're just small um, round cells. And this is forward scatter here over side scatter. And so it's size versus density. So that you can see you're starting out with a very small, uh, dense population of cells uniform that then extend out because the cells get bigger and bigger and bigger. Then if we go on to figure two, so what we've done is we've used that exact system in the A on the upper uh, panels here, this is time zero. This is what we're looking at now is the IL-2 receptor alpha chain. And so they're all positive uh, at time zero. This is the isotype control. And so it would be over here. Uh, and then after six hours of interleukin-2, you can see that you, there's a down regulation of the IL-2 receptor. And it's even um, more pronounced at um, and after 21, 20 hours, which is it's because of the ligand induced internalization of the receptor. Um, then if we go on to this, we go on to figure three, and, and this is the propidium iodide staining for the cell cycle analysis. So what we have now here is exactly the same setup as before. We have time, time equal T equals zero, 12, 21.5, 24, 32 and 48 hours. And so perpidium iodide will stain in a quantitative fashion. And so in resting G0, G1 cells, you would just have a single peak of DNA. Here we've got a little peak over here. And those are cells that are in um, G2 and, or, or in the process of mitosis. So at time zero, these are the percentages down here that are, that are calculated from these quantitative staining. So the percent in G were 82% were in G1, 10% um, were in S, and 8% were in G2M. So then you can see that that's pretty much the same thing at 12 hours. But by 20 hours, now we've only got 66% in, in um, G1, 28% in S, starting to move over in S. And that's more, much more pronounced at 24 hours because see now, you don't just have very low baseline. Now you have um, these cells moving into S phase. So the, what you've got though is, is a um, time span here of at least 12 hours where, where uh, things are happening in G1, but the question is, you know, what's happening? And so that's why, that's how the experiments were set up. So then we go on to the RNA expression, the Northern blots, of um, these kinds of um, prepared cells prepared. So here we have in A, this is uh, plus IL-2, uh, and in B uh, is a control. 
those are without IL-2. So this is plus IL-2, that's without IL-2. And, you, and these are different time points, three, six, nine, and so forth. And you can see here's cyclin D2. So there's three cyclins. There's D1, D2, and D3. I forgot to tell you that. That was discovered back in just in 91, 92. Um, and so cyclin D2 is expressed early on, three hours. It looks like it peaks around six hours, and then nine hours and 12 hours, and then by 20 hours, it's, fall, it's fallen off. And by comparison, D3 isn't, isn't evident until six hours. And, and then it, it, it seems like it goes all the way through. Um, and because the cells are, are progressing through S phase at this stage of the game, right in here. <clears throat> then here's cyclin A that appears um, basically coincident with the S phase. Um, down here uh, in the B panel is a, is a um, protein blot. Look, using the <clears throat> anti serum to D3, and where the arrow is, it's pointing to the D3-sized protein of 32.5 uh, kilodaltons, essentially. Um, the other thing that she points out is, is that what uh, Doreen's paper <clears throat> had emphasized was, is that the Cell cycle progression is IL-2 concentration dependent. And so she did these, this experiment where she used a low concentration of IL-2 and looked at D2, D3, and so forth, and compared that with a higher concentration of IL-2. So you, you see the same pattern in, in terms of the cyclin uh, D2 and, and D3 expression, as well as cyclin E, which is expressed later um, and, and to a minimal extent, um, it, it really at the G1S phase boundary, which was which is interesting. The other thing that um, that she examined was the duration of IL2, and so this is a two-hour exposure of the cells to IL2. So she's dissecting out the early G1 phase much more carefully in this experiment, and so you can see two hours. You you can see D2 don't see any D3 at that time period. With six hours, now you see D, D2 easily, and now you're seeing D3, and then uh, more prominent at 10 hours. She goes on to, to show, and this is uh, figure seven and figure eight on the next page, and I recommend that you read these. I'm not gonna go through these, but the same sort of thing. Um, in, in figure seven, she shows that cyclosporin A um, does not, uh, prevent the uh, IL-2 effect on both the, the um, D2 and D3 expression as well as the cell cycle progression. And rapamycin is interesting because it doesn't, does not also um, uh, inhibit the cyclin D expression, but it does block the entrance into the S phase of, of the cell cycle. So that's all I'm going to show you on this. We'll stop the screen sharing now. So so that, that's um, really interesting and uh, data and so well done. And there's a lot of work in this because she had to, you know, prepare all the cells and do all the things and then and, and make all the blots and then wash off, do one probe, then wash it off, and do another probe. And so it took a while, <laughs> you can imagine. So the thing is, uh, in the discussion of this paper, then they may make, or she makes, the, the following points. And this is that the expression of cyclin D, D2, D3, and E are directly regulated by IL-2. So now we have, and so that's interesting. And she says, obviously, because of the kinetics of expression, that, that the expression of D2 as well as D3 um, is most probably important for, um, for G1 progression. And cyclin E may be important <clears throat> for G1S phase transition uh, or, or the, the restriction point of, <clears throat> of Part D. And cyclin A seems to be very important during uh, DNA replication. So these findings were, were all new and um, I think the, the reason I like it, obviously, is, is because I think our contribution was setting up the system so that she could do these elegant experiments. Yeah. Subsequently, you know, as, as I mentioned, 
last week, Carol Beatling's experiments um, when she uh, left my lab and went to Doreen's lab in London um, with looking at the TCR in, in, in terms of the early biochemical events um, happening after TCR activation versus IL-2 receptor activation and um, showing that the JAK stats that were just, had just been this, well, they'd, they'd been in development since 1984 by Jim Darnell and also Ian Kerr and George Stark uh, in London, but it wasn't clear, you know, whether or not the, these early signaling pathways in the IL-2 story were what was, what was true. And so that was true. And so the thing is, so now we have target genes. We had the target genes that Carol had found in, in my lab. Now we have this cyclin D2 and D3 and maybe E and maybe even A dependent on IL-2 signaling. We didn't know what was being signaled. Now we knew that it's the JAK stat pathways uh, are a major part of that. Maybe not all, hmm. as we may get into as time goes on. And what we didn't, so we're beginning to piece things together as to what's really happening when cells, when normal cells are stimulated to grow. And of course, my whole um, bent from the beginning uh, of my career was is that I wanted to understand cancer, it's the growth of cancer cells. But um, I, I felt that we, what we needed to do first was understand how normal cells are signaled to grow. And so we're beginning be able to understand what's in this black box of a cell as it's getting activated to grow. So I'll stop there. Before you leave, like the video, click on the bell, subscribe, go to the website, read the paper, really a wonderful paper. Um, and I'll see you next week.